Hello, everyone. I'm Cheryl Miller Hauser, and today I am going to share my insights as a filmmaker about how marketers can use storytelling tactics to form an emotional bond with their customers. At the heart of it, it's finding people who are relatable and share their emotions and taking the audience on that emotional journey with them. But before I start, I'm going to turn the lens on the storyteller and share with you how I'm feeling right now. I'm really excited to be here. I'm really grateful you've chosen to join me today. And I am, my heart is racing, my head is racing, and I'm feeling really nervous. So I have a question. Show of hands, who here can relate to that feeling? Wonderful. Well, you've just experienced empathy. I'm excited to share my insights because I've experienced firsthand as a filmmaker how exhilarating it is to tell stories that move people deeply and provide change for them and for society. Um, because marketers have such huge influence on culture and on people, you have the opportunity to do this on a grand scale. I've been telling stories like this for over 30 years, mostly through film and video, as a producer and director. Feature documentaries like Children of Darkness about children with mental illness that was nominated for an Academy Award. David O. Russell's first movie, Spanking the Monkey, which won the Sundance Audience Award and hundreds of hours of television for outlets like National Geographic and Discovery Channel. But about 10 years ago, I saw something really exciting happening in advertising. Visionary brands like Patagonia and Dove were opening people's eyes and creating social movements by telling stories that reflected their values. So six years ago, I launched Creative Breed, an empathy agency to work with companies to help them tell stories like this. We make short and long form documentaries, web series, commercials, branded content, and all forms of human-centered storytelling across all platforms. It's now imperative that every company tell stories that reflect their values. And this is because today people want to buy from, work at, and invest in companies that share their values. There have been so many studies done about this, I'm going to share a few. So Cone Porter Novelli did a study that showed that 79% of Americans are more loyal to purpose-driven brands. 77% expect brands to have a positive impact on society and 73% are likely to share information or stories about purpose-driven brands. This isn't just happening in the United States, it's happening all over the world. A study from Edelman has shown us that 65% of consumers globally are making purchasing decisions based on a brand's values and social impact. The companies achieving the greatest impact today lead with a clear purpose, and then they embed their values in everything they do. And then they tell stories that reflect those values. My focus today is on storytelling tactics, not marketing strategies or distribution tactics. What I'm going to share can be distributed in any, in any format. So this kind of storytelling is a bold departure from conventional advertising. And this is how. Instead of pushing products, marketers now need to create a deep emotional connection with their customers. This kind of storytelling requires taking risk as well. It also requires empathy, empathy to listen to your customers' emotional needs and the needs of the wider world and to put those first, not a brand's needs. If you do that, your needs will be taken care of too because 95% of purchasing decisions are based on emotion. So what are the elements 
that go into telling a great story. I'm going to share three that, that I've found to be really effective and critical for fostering an emotional connection and driving people to action. Each one is related and builds on the next. So, feature people who are relatable and express the full range of human emotion. They become your emotional vehicles and allow a brand to be human and real. Show struggle. This provides a framework to elicit emotion from the people you feature. And third, provide uplift and a call to action. This moves your audience to convert their emotions into action. Let's now look at how successful campaigns use these elements effectively. It seems easy. We're going to see some great examples, but it, it's actually in, to execute well is not so easy. So the first, feature people who are relatable and express the full range of human emotion. Uh, applied to marketing, I would say that means find people who are relatable to your customers and embody your values. And then take viewers on an emotional journey through their experiences. I recently produced and co-directed a feature documentary, Generation Startup, which follows six recent college graduates for a year and a half launching startups in Detroit. People are often surprised to hear that the charitable arm of two major corporations, PwC and UBS, funded our film. PwC Charitable Foundation and UBS's foundation arm did this because the film reflects their values and their missions of supporting businesses and entrepreneurs, driving economic rejuvenation through entrepreneurship, and spurring greater diversity in the workplace. The people we cast embody all of those values, as you'll see in our trailer. I've never built a company before. I'm 24 years old. Certainly often feel like I'm in over my head. I don't know what I'm doing, and it makes me extremely nervous. What keeps me up the most is like, am I really, as a person, capable of building this company? You so badly wish that I wasn't working at a startup, right? But it's a hundred percent. Do you think that people should do what makes them happy? Uh, no. The risk of failure is so high that there's a good chance that I'm investing years of my life in things that will ultimately fail. To start a company, you have to be crazy. None of us had any experience. I might have taken on more than I can handle. I work 18, 20 hour days. I fail multiple times a day. We live out of a motel. Hello? We only had three weeks of money left. Just about everything you can imagine went wrong. We made 18,000 pounds of bad product. Oh my god. If we don't have a product, we don't have a company. We're in this. Like, we jumped off the cliff. Like, there's no going back. So, like, I have to do it or die trying. For me, it always comes back to you have to play the game to change it. 90-something percent of startups fail. I'm just going to make it my number one priority not to. Have you heard of Bonza? Really good. When you buy three, you get hugs. Oh, thank you so much. Being a startup founder, it's about building something and getting somewhere. You should fix your hair, by the way. <laughs> I guess it's better. You start to realize everything is going to seem terrifying, but you'll figure it out one step at a time. There's no ceiling. There's always more room to grow and more room to achieve. It's surprised me what being passionate about something can change a gear within myself or anybody else, really. I definitely did not see any of this coming. Thank you. So I've traveled with this film to film festivals, theatrical releases, scores of event screenings, and around the world with the State Department. And it has been overwhelming 
for me to see how people across all demographics are deeply moved by our characters, regardless of nationality, gender, race, age, economic level. And that is because we cast people who are universally relatable on an emotional level. Casting is one of the most critical elements in telling stories that form an emotional connection with others. And this is one of the most critical aspects in casting. To find people who are vulnerable, because people are most relatable when they are vulnerable, when they let down the facades that we all put up to impress other people, and when they express the full range of emotion that we all experience. So fear, self-doubt, shame, sadness, disappointment, longing, happiness, joy, love. Through those universally relatable feelings, our characters' experiences become the experiences of our viewers. And that is the power of empathy. And this is the power of great storytelling, regardless of me the medium. Powerful stories bring people inside an emotional experience. They communicate through showing, not telling. Here's Dextina. She grew up in poverty and graduated from MIT with a degree in mechanical engineering. Given that 2% of engineers in our country are black women, it is no wonder that Dextina always feels like the different one. I'm very aware of being different all the time. And I see that I have to keep my wall up. That's something that's really stressful right now. Um, yeah, there's not a time where I don't <laughs> walk into a room and feel like, well, I hope I don't do anything embarrassing that'll represent every woman out there, <laughs> or like, you know, <laughs> or just like, or say anything that's just too black, or, you know, be perceived as angry when I'm just saying facts. Um, It's, it gets old. So viewers relate to Dextina because going on the journey with her brings up feelings for themselves of having felt left out. I think it's something we can all relate to. We weren't invited to a birthday party or a wedding. We weren't picked for a sports team. And they also, viewers identify with her drive, her determination her resilience. So through Dextina's emotional journey, we're able to show, not tell, how important it is to create workplaces that are more diverse and also more inclusive, values that are really important to our, our sponsors. Labib is another character in the film who wants to live life on his own terms. Uh, something very important for entrepreneurs and also something I think that most people can relate to. In his instance, it's a very bold move. You so badly wish that I wasn't working in a startup right now. Uh, 100%. You know, I believe in number and data, right? Yeah. Then I told you that 10% only startups succeeded the last 20 years. Since pre-K, I am whatever the money I have, I am investing you, investing you. And I, I want to see my son has some position, that study job, then I don't need to worry about, like, he doesn't have a money in the next week. Okay. Your parents doesn't have a house, and your parents doesn't have any that, that study is. job or, you know, any money in the bank, so I... I, I know. I, I know that to. I am on my so own. So that right. this is, this is the reason I am why you just worry, okay? I'm very else. intimately aware of this fact. When you're gonna go in that company, then everybody will be thinking you're a loser. Do you think that people should do what makes them happy? Uh, no.
So by the end of the film, viewers feel inspired to reach for their North Star and find and build meaning in their lives, in their communities. And that was one of the major goals that we, the filmmakers, and our sponsors had in making this movie. This process of fostering this kind of empathy in viewers requires empathy on the part of the storytellers as well. In both casting and filming, we engaged empathy to see things from the point of view of our characters. By the way, I call them characters, even though they're subjects, they're real people. I'll use that word characters all morning, or you know, throughout the talk, but you know what I mean. Um, but um, so, so by seeing things from their point of view, that is how we were able to understand them and form a bond with them. And it's also how we were able to ask deeply personal and uncomfortable questions, but always with great sensitivity, and to capture very uncomfortable verite moments like you just saw with Labib's family. We also engaged empathy to listen actively and carefully. I don't know if you noticed in the clip with Dextina, there were some very long and awkward silences. And it's often after those long silences that people do reveal their innermost feelings, but it's our normal instinct to dive in when there's that silence uh, and fill the hole. So I would say try it with friends, with family, with colleagues, and you'll see. Um, filming with real people also requires a different approach to production than um, people in the advertising world might be um, comfortable with. Um, it requires being comfortable with greater uncertainty. Um, a verite follow doc shot over a year and a half took that uncertainty to an extreme because we had no idea where our characters' stories would end up. We ended up with 240 hours of footage that we then had to hone to a 90-minute cohesive story, and that was rough. But you know, oftentimes you can create a pre-shoot story arc and go into a shoot with that kind of guidance, but you can't tell real people what to say or do. They won't be genuine, they won't be natural. So it's that, that nice balance between knowing your goals and what you want to capture, but also really staying spontaneous and open to the magic that happens. Um, the brand Yeti tells amazing stories like this. Their storytelling has helped the brand develop a cult following and make a really unsexy commodity, coolers, into an object of desire. Um, the people they cast reflect Yeti's values of cherishing the outdoors, pursuing our passion, dedication to family, and the people also reflect qualities of the Yeti products, um, endurance, grit, resilience, excellence. They didn't always tell stories like this. When Yeti launched in 2006, they made videos that demonstrated the durability of their coolers, and they had a loyal following among avid hunter, hunters and fishermen. But in 2015, they started making short mini docs and editorial content that were character driven, they featuring people who reflect the brand and they don't, they don't talk about the product at all. Um, so they, they tell emotionally engaging stories about hunters, fishermen, bull riders, surfers, skiers, and other people who pursue their passions in, in the outdoors. But this is the brilliance of the Yeti stories. These people are so universally relatable on an emotional level that these character profiles have helped Yeti become popular among all demographics. The New York Times ran an article about Yeti last year with this headline. Can a $300 cooler unite America? And the article starts off with this. In a country where we can't seem to agree on anything, one opinion has lately reached a broad consensus among diverse groups of people. Yeti is pretty awesome. 
More and more brands are beginning to tell mini docs as a marketing vehicle. And I'm, I'm going to share a snapshot, really big picture view of, of how one can approach this. So as a brand, obviously, you have to define your goals, audience, and what you want to communicate in a mini doc. Then find a skilled documentary filmmaker because it is a skill that, that, is, that one has to hone, both the accessing that human center and also uh, cap, you know, the narrative story structure. And then with the filmmaker, casting people who reflect your brand and show vulnerability. I can't stress enough how important this step is. And then the filmmaker should conduct a pre-shoot interview and based on pre-shoot interviews, create a loose story outline that conveys the story arc and themes of the people's story, determine where and what to shoot, including if there are any other people to capture, determine the visual style, and then go into the field with that roadmap, but stay flexible and spontaneous during the shoot. And then in edit, select the most expressive and relatable moments and craft a strong narrative arc. I mean, when we get into edit with footage, we watch it down and just pull, pull, pull all of those moments. You feel it, those moments that are so, so universally relatable. So let's look at one short clip to see how Yeti executes. Sam, the, the video Sam is about um, a duck hunter and his dog, Sam. And while it is about the relationship between a man and his dog, it's really about love, loss, and how we all have to make the most of our time here. In the beginning of the video, the duck hunter's son, Steve's son, says, my father is not an emotional man. He's not one to show his emotions. But Steve's son is wrong about that. This clip is a great example of how you can capture a lot of emotion through someone's facial and body expressions, and even the body expressions of a dog. We all reach a point in our life, dogs, humans, everybody, where you just can't do what you used to. Sammy, hey. Where you could really tell is when it was late season and cold. Like, man, I don't know if I should even be letting her do this. You know you see that chapter in their life. You know when they should retire, but you try to get them that last duck. You take them out on a warm day like this when there are some ducks around and, and you try to get them that last retrieve. The goal of the year, get her one more and let her relax the rest of her life. It's hard to watch, but then at the same time, you think, wow, what an achievement. I didn't give up on that dog. Steve actually cries on camera. And it's amazing to see in the comment section under this video how many men confess to crying with him. It's amazing actually to, watch, to read the comments under all of the Yeti stories videos. People share such deeply personal things. They talk about how the videos moved them and, and how they related to them. As a filmmaker, this is one of my favorite comments doesn't get any better than this. I'm going to buy another 10 Yetis to add to my existing 10, just so you'll keep funding short films like this. <laughs> All of this helps explain how Yeti sales have gone from 100, and this and the fact that they have great products, has gone from 148 million in 2014 to almost 800 million last year. 
The company went public in October and the stock price keeps rising. So Aerie, which makes lingerie and activewear for women, also features people who are relatable to their customers, reflect Aerie's values, and show a range of emotion. They're doing this through print uh, and billboard advertising, social media, in-store experiences, and every touch point with the brand, all of which has become the brand story. Earlier I said that advertisers in a purpose-driven economy now need to listen to the emotional needs of their customers and put those first. And this is exactly what Aerie did. About five years ago, people at the brand <clears throat> listened carefully to what their customers were saying, and this is what they heard. That the perfect, skinny, flawless models that we're seeing in, in fashion advertising made women feel bad about themselves. They wanted to see bodies celebrated and featured that looked like them. And so in 2014, Aerie embraced their Aerie Real branding. Let's look at some of their ads. These are recent ads. You don't get more real, relatable, and vulnerable than these women. We can even see stretch marks since Aerie does not Photoshop or airbrush their ads. The brand now celebrates customers' real bodies on their Instagram feed, building a large and supportive community of women who find connection and inspiration through each other and through the brand. Aerie is not only helping women feel good about their bodies, it's also changing how society defines female beauty. So by understanding their customers' needs, people at Aerie have turned their brand into a social and cultural movement. They're driving positive change, brand awareness, and revenue. We're seeing more and more brands do this, which is great. Aerie's purpose-driven marketing and storytelling has been very profitable for the company. They've seen double-digit sales the past four years and plan on opening 80 new stores. So now let's look at the second storytelling element I mentioned. Show struggle. Casting people who are emotionally expressive and relatable is critical. But you also want to tell stories that organically elicit emotion from your characters. And the story structure of struggle and triumph is very effective to do this. I added triumph because if you want to drive a positive association with the brand and you want to spur people to positive action, your characters do have to achieve their goal. This is also something to keep in mind as you find your characters and stories. The bigger the goal and stakes, the larger the obstacles someone has to overcome, the harder they struggle, the more people will root for them, feel empathy, and be emotionally transported by them. The journey of struggle and triumph also provides a really excellent narrative arc and dramatic tension. The three examples we've seen today all entail struggle, but we're going to look at two now through specifically that prism. So one way to structure a story around struggle is to find someone or or a group of people who literally struggle to reach a goal. This is what Nat Geo did uh, at the end of last year in a commercial they made to reflect their values of being curious, passionate, and unstoppable. Their definition of an explorer. This spot is based on a, on a true story and the uh, real character, the real person is in it. My name is Nadine, and I was born in Syria with cerebral palsy. I couldn't go to school, so TV became my classroom. When the war came, my sister and I had to leave. I wasn't supposed to see the bright side of my journey. So I made it an adventure. 
and discovered all sorts of new things, like boats, and trains, and the best hot chocolate I've ever had. I wasn't supposed to make it past Syria. Or Turkey. Or Austria. But here I am, in a classroom I was never supposed to be in. So imagine how I feel. When people tell me I can't be an astronaut. Nugene is the hero of the spot, but so is Nat Geo in an organic, authentic way because the channel played such an important role in shaping Nugene's life. And in this spot, the channel plays an important role in her struggle. First, her struggle to get an education, and secondly, her struggle to get from war-torn Syria to Germany. So again, here's that example of show, don't tell. They're showing us how Nat Geo transforms and inspires people. Unlike the other real life examples, this is a dramatization with two of the real people, Nugene and her sister. And I know I said, it's a really bad idea to shoot with real people. You're not gonna get genuine emotion. And that is usually true. Um, a famous director, Reed Morano, who created Handmaid's Tale, directed this spot, and she, even she, was nervous about working with Nugene for that reason. But again, she uh, used her empathy to form a deep bond and trust with Nugene before the shoot and also during the shoot, and she even shot the piece herself so she could stay really close to Nugene and provide a lot of encouragement and direction. By telling the story of Nugene's struggle, Nat Geo tapped into one of the most pressing issues of our day, the refugee crisis. And in doing so, this 130-year-old brand achieved one of their goals of their rebranding, which is to go from revered to relevant. Let's now see how you can show struggle in a different way through the Microsoft Super Bowl ad. This is a slightly longer version. My name is Grover. Sean. My name is Ian. I'm Taylor. My name is Owen, and I am nine and a half years old. I only have one. <laughs> and yeah. I love video games, my friends, my family, and again, video games. Whenever I play it, it makes me feel happy. The fun that you get to have with connecting with your friends. You make your own rules. It's his way of interacting with his friends when he can't physically otherwise do it. When I'm playing with a regular controller, there's some things that don't work for me. It's difficult for me to use both joysticks and the D-pad at the exact same time. And it just slowed me down a bunch more while other people were like She's never had the freedom to play at the level she knows she could. I never thought it was unfair. I just thought, hey, this is the way it is and it's not gonna change. What I like about the adaptive controller is that now everyone can play. I don't even have to look at the controller and just be like looking at the screen like, hey, yep, yep. You never want your kid to feel like an outsider or an other. One of the biggest fears early on is, how will Owen be viewed by the other kids? <laughs> He's not different when he plays. It's a little challenging, but that's the whole point of gaming. I can hit the buttons just as fast as they can. And I think I can crush my friends. <laughs> no matter how your body is or how fast you are, you can play. It's a really good thing to have in this world. I love this clapping. I mean, when I saw the new jean spot, I cried. When I saw this spot, I cried. So I guess that's the point of 
the talk today. Um, so, so this amazing spot reflects Microsoft's values of innovation and inclusion and also their mission to empower every person and organization to achieve more. Did you notice how closely it follows the classic structure of goal, obstacles, struggle, and triumph? I mean, that was a real narrative arc, even though it doesn't actually seem that way at face value. So early on, the kids' goals are very clear. They, they want to find happiness and connection with their friends. And next we see the obstacles. They, they literally show us their disabilities. And then we see the struggles they're having with the conventional controller. And then at about halfway in, they unbox the adaptive controller. And then we're swept up on this emotional journey with them of triumph as they reach their goals. Though Microsoft is selling their values in this spot, they're also showing off a lot of the features of the adaptive controller, but we never feel like we're being sold a product because it's all in service to the story, the emotional journey of the kids. This is a terrific storytelling technique. When I was making those hundreds of hours of television for Nat Geo Discovery and other channels, I was working with a lot of very complex historical, engineering, scientific information. But because we were embedding that information in service to the stories we were telling, people found the information entertaining and accessible. Even with dense medical information, I did almost 100 hours of a, a very popular show on Discovery Health Channel called Dr. G Medical Examiner. So in each episode, which we structured as medical mysteries, a body would show up in the morgue, and Dr. G would have to figure out how did this person die. So we had so much complex medical information and health tips in that show, but people loved it because it helped them solve the medical mystery along with Dr. G. So marketers can do the same as we've seen in the Microsoft spot with their products. So this is a big storytelling technique that if you want to integrate products in a spot, think story first, then product in service to your story. Your spot will be more engaging and you will also be more effective in your messaging. And the story of, sci of the science of storytelling tells us why this is. There are a ton of studies about this, so you can actually Google it. The people take in and remember information far better when it's delivered in service to a story. And because the adaptive controller is the hero that helps the kids reach their goal, we form an emotional bond with the adaptive controller through their emotional journey. It's interesting that Microsoft hadn't done a Super Bowl ad in four years, and this is what they came back with, and it was super successful. Unruly, which measures people's responses to ads, uh, said that this was the most effective commercial of the night in connecting with potential customers emotionally and also with their intent to purchase. It scored highest not only on emotional indices of happiness, amazement, warmth, pride, and inspiration, but also a staggering 95% on credibility and authenticity, which is the huge advantage of filming with real people and just letting them be themselves. It's been inspiring to see how Microsoft, uh, Microsoft's new CEO Satya Nadella is embedding empathy in everything the company does. He's even written a book, Hit Refresh, to encourage all of us to tap into empathy. He developed his empathy through his children. His eldest son has limited communication skills, is visually impaired and quadriplegic, and one of his daughters has learning disabilities. So it's no wonder that he's now using empathy to, to lead Microsoft to create a huge range of products that meet all people's needs. We've come to the third element of storytelling, uh, 
to engage an audience, provide uplift and a call to action. Once you have fostered empathy and moved people deeply, then provide a call to action to move them to convert their emotions into action. And I don't just mean the call to action to buy a product, although if you've been successful in forming that emotional bond, you will be successful at that too. I mean, create a call to action that inspires people to do something related to the values you're conveying. This is one of the ways that companies can go from just showing their values through storytelling to use storytelling to provide transformation to their customers in the wider world. To do that requires ending on uplift, but uplift that is genuine and hard won. This is another reason why showing struggle is an effective tool. If we think back on the examples today, they all provide uplift and a call to action. One of the boldest calls to action in a marketing campaign with major uplift as well has been Nike's Just Do It campaign with Colin Kaepernick, the former San Francisco 49er who was the first to kneel during NFL games to protest racial inequality and pr police brutality. I assume that everyone in this room is intimately familiar with that campaign, so I'm not going to do a deep dive. I don't know about you, but I felt hugely inspired when Colin Kaepernick released this tweet last Labor Day. With this call to action, believe in something, even if it means sacrificing everything. Nike took its own message to heart, sacrificing pissing off a lot of people because Kaepernick's kneeling had come to also be an anti-Trump issue. While some people burned their sneakers and railed against Nike on social media and the stock went down a little bit in the first days, no single ad has had a more dramatic and positive effect on a business in recent years or achieved greater social and cultural relevance than this campaign. Nike's social media mentions went up 135% after the ad debuted. They had seven to one positive mentions on YouTube. By the end of this quarter, their sales had gone up by 10% and their stock price up 7% to an all-time high. So what does the success of Nike's bold move and this call to action, believe in something, even if it means sacrificing everything, tell us? It tells us that we are in a brave new world of advertising, one in which storytelling, empathy, values, and taking a stand that reflect your values and your customers' values are all crucial. I heeded this call when I left my job as head of production at a TV production company to found Creative Breed. While it wasn't a controversial move, I sacrificed a secure job, a big paycheck, a big title, because of my belief that companies can be the engine of tremendous positive social impact, and because I believe in the power of storytelling and want to work with companies to help them tell these kinds of stories. It was terrifying to set up my own company, the scariest thing I've ever done. Um, it's been really hard to break into an industry I didn't grow up in. I face obstacles every day, but it is so rewarding and really exhilarating to be doing something I love, to be telling stories that reflect my values, to move people deeply and to have the chance to work with people like you. My call to action to you is this, have the courage to commit to your values and lead with them in your actions and your marketing. Tell stories that feature people who are relatable and express vulnerability. 
Show them struggle as they reach for a goal, as a way to elicit the full range of emotion in them. Provide value to people beyond your products and services. And provide inspiration and a call to action to move people to take positive action. And lastly, have the courage to break with advertising convention in how you tell those stories so that they can have the impact you want them to have. Given the huge reach and influence that marketing has and the vast amounts that companies spend on advertising, we all have the opportunity to do so much good while doing well. Let's all take that journey together. So I'll take some questions from Slido. I can take some questions from the audience. First question, how do you develop the questions to ask your characters to draw them out and peel back their layers? So it's a great question, and again, it gets to the heart of um, empathy. It's really about, you know, when, when you're beginning to talk to people, you start out with questions that are not threatening at all. And, you know, if I'm, if I'm talking to somebody who's a mom, and they tell me about their children, I'll share some stories about being a mom and some stories about my children. And so that we're beginning to form a bond and there's a common language and a common understanding. And then I can go a little deeper and ask a question about, you know, something that's a little more personal and a little more personal. And it's also about the manner in which we ask the questions, right? If, if we, if we approach things with genuine interest and genuine curiosity, it's not transactional. It's really about truly engaging. And I, this is true in real life also. I mean, when you meet somebody, and if you just show genuine interest, that's how you're going to get to the heart of things. So uh, how to use storytelling for boring and technical products in digital marketing. <laughs> well, again, I, I think that, um, you know, my, my talk today and what I love to do best, I mean, I've done stuff that hasn't always been human-centered, but um, people care about other people. They really, you know, if, if, it's, if it's a technical product and it's a short spot, then maybe a graphic is the way to go because you want to demonstrate in a quick burst digitally, you know, the, the product. But again, it's, it's unlikely you're going to, well, you could form an emotional bond if, if, the, uh, if it's really well executed and clever and, and, and great design. But again, people form bonds with other people. Um, and it's, as we saw with the Yeti stories, with the Microsoft, and it's through that connection to other people and other people's emotions that we then form the bond with, with the physical objects, usually. But there are ways for a quick hit to do things that are fun through graphics and other ways. Um, do you see the same rules applying for B2B branding? And I would say absolutely. I mean, when one business is talking to another business, it's still about showing, first of all, I mean, it's, it's sales 101, right? I mean, no matter how one is selling, it's about forming a relationship. So you want to, and how do we form relationships with each other? Whether you're a business or a human being, it's through that emotional connection. So yes, I, it's absolutely valid to apply there as well. Um, does anyone have a question at a microphone? Yes, I do. Hi. <laughs> um, I'm really happy that you brought up the Kaepernick example from Nike. Um, I just came out um, I, of a conference about truth and transparency. I work in advertising, and for me, the Kaepernick piece was extremely problematic when you think that the CEO of Nike wrote a $1 million, $100 million check to 
you know, the Republican Party, and that piece with Kaepernick is specifically um, in relation with the Republican Party. So I want to hear your thoughts on if you think that empathy has become a commodity for brands and just another way to make just dollars at the end of the day, and if there's truth in that empathy. Oh, that's a great question. Um, so, you know, and I don't know, did he give the money personally or from the... Oh, yeah, it was a personal $100 million check to the Republican Party. Wow. I, am I... Right. I, you know, I, I, there, there are a lot of questions to unpack here. So one is, um, we all have personal lives, and we all run businesses. And, um, you know, I think if you look at Patagonia, uh, the, the, the CEO and the founder and, you know, through and through, 100%. I mean, I, I think at the, at the end of the day, we are living also in a, in a world of transparency. So, I, you know, first and foremost, I was talking about storytelling, and I was there. It was important to me to start with the premise that a brand must be purpose-driven and understand its values and embed them in everything they do. You can't just go out and tell stories. Um, brand washing, green washing, pink washing. I mean, I, I think that uh, customers and people will punish brands, increasingly punish brands for this, and call them out on it. Um, you know, in this instance, it definitely Nike knew what their largest customer base cared about, and they tapped into that. Um, I do think that Nike's, you know, it's, they've helped the brand. They've, they've also spurred a lot of conversation. They're giving money to the Kaepernick Foundation. You're right. I mean, there is a disconnect there if the CEO is giving personal money to the Republican Party um, and then the question becomes, should he be running Nike? Not should Nike be supporting Kaepernick, I think. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think people, are people, people should be calling the company out on that. I mean, listen, the, the ad came out also several months after the huge expose of Nike about, uh, you know, the problems internally with misogyny and how they treat women and all of that. So um, hopefully they're doing, a, you know, a lot to correct that. I, I mean, I think that consumers have a lot of power today to put pressure on brands and to speak out on social media and through their purchasing dollars. I mean, that is, uh, that is why brands now must be accountable. So hopefully we'll be seeing that across the board. Thank you. Yes, hi, thank you for your talk. Um, I, uh, I was curious about I think you presented certainly one model for a story of, of um, you know, uh, relatable characters, struggle, um, uh, and then at the end, and ending up in triumph. I'm wondering if another storyboard works for brands as well. So a, a let's say, not ending up in triumph. Or um, I'm wondering if other, other models you've seen really work for brands. I mean, you can certainly not end in triumph, but it is, you know, I, I think that um, when you take people on a really intense emotional journey, and if you end on um, despair, like what, what do people do with that emotion? Um, I, and I think that if, even if you look at, you know, the you know, social issue documentaries that have spurred a lot of change, usually they do end with, like, this is what we can do. Like, you know, so, I, I, yes, I mean, you can't always end on triumph. I mean, it, triumph can't be Pollyannish and it can't be fabricated. But I, I don't know, I, I think that, um, I, I love telling stories about the strength of the human spirit or about, um, and, and triumph doesn't mean, I mean, triumph can be, you know, our movie, you saw Labib. By the end of our film, Labib, Labib is about to lose his parents and is fired from his job. And people feel like Labib has succeeded. At the end of the film, I get the question all the time, how did you pick six people who, were so, who, who ended up so successful? I say, wait a minute, like how do you, like Labib ends like really with a lot of troubles, but they feel he has triumphed because he's learned so much and he's grown so much. So I think that triumph isn't, I, I didn't mean triumph in necessarily a, um, 
you know, conventional way. It could be a very broad sense of the word. Yeah, but I mean, I, I, I just, I, you know, it's, if, if you do end um, not on triumph or on a uplift, it is much harder to then tell people to go out and do things. They, they're so, they feel like, why should I even try? There's no hope, there's no reason. Nothing's gonna, nothing's gonna come of it, so why should I even do it? Thank you. Sure. So, um, sorry. I just wanted to ask you one question. Um, in a world where we've been bombarded by emotional stories in pretty much everything from advertising to, I don't know, the voice and all of those other things, are we going to become immune to it eventually in the same way that we become immune to terrible stories on the news? I hope not. I hope it will have the opposite effect. Um, you know, there, again, this... Uh, the science of storytelling, and I didn't have time to get into it, uh, shows us that when people are moved by a story, they secrete oxytocin, which is a hormone that we secrete when we hug, when we kiss, when mothers breastfeed. It makes you feel warm and fuzzy. It, it creates empathy and an openness. I think stories, and I've seen this with the you know, stuff I've done, I think it can break down the silos between us and, and help people really understand, at the end of the day, human beings, we all share so much. And you know, we all have the same needs. We all have the same wants, regardless of race, religion, gender, you know, nationality. So I think that, the, and I, I, I believe strongly that hate begets hate and that love begets love. And I think that the more we can tell stories like this, the more that we will open people up to warm and fuzzies instead of the negative stuff. Maybe I'm an idealist, but yeah. So, um, do you think social media and our addiction to super short snackable content where it's all about six seconds or less is killing our ability to tell stories? I, you know, I think storytelling is amazing across all platforms, and I think that, um, you know, my, my daughter, she doesn't do it so much anymore, but she was on Snapchat for two years, and her Snapchat videos, they were so funny and creative, and like this creative outlet for her. I thought they were great storytelling. Um, I think what we're seeing is really interesting, like the Yeti stories, when they started making them, they were six minutes long, the Yeti, the newest ones, they're 20 minutes long. And these are not fast-moving mini-docs. They're, they're really kind of slow. Um, Square is doing mini-docs, beautiful mini-docs. Um, they started out also 68 minutes long. Now they're 20 minutes long as well. So I, I don't know, I think that, that, and you know, there's this huge renaissance of documentaries, um, super popular. I think people, um, if anything, I, I, I think things like are cyclical, and I think people are now longing now for greater engagement and um, and stories that you know that they can dig into more. I mean, look at look at Netflix. I mean, people like binge watch, you know, ten hours at a time. So yeah. So. Um, do. You, Do you think these lessons also apply to textual productions? Do you see resemblance differences? Um, what is the, the meaning of textual in that sense? Uh, I don't know who asked the question. Written, for sure. I mean, editorial content, again, Yeti Stories has these videos, they also have editorial content where you can read. I mean, if you read an article in the newspaper, oftentimes it follows what, you know, uh, what I've been talking about, like lead with human, human first, and then, so yes, I think editorial, I think, yeah, it's always, you know, if you if grab people with that human element and the re relatability f uh, factor, it can apply across any medium. I think we're out of time, but I'd be happy to ask, answer a question uh, uh, outside. Or, yeah, I think, I, I'm seeing, uh, yeah. Well, thank you.